it's always fun to be back here. Uh, and so I don't know. I know uh, it's a small group. Some of you have seen this talk before, but I, I think some of you haven't. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, let me just tell you a problem. So it's a communication problem. It's kind of a, a, a strange one. So we have Alice and Bob. And um, so Alice gets as input uh, sigma permutation in Sn and a bit. And she gets this, and I'll go. In, I'll have to go into details about how she gets it. She gets it in a streaming fashion, and she writes something. What she's going to write is a, a vector of length of n bits. So Alice is going to send this vector x and 0, 1 to the n to Bob. But this vector is constrained. And I'll tell you how that's done in a minute. And now Bob receives, receives x. And um, Bob outputs a subset of 1 through n. And the requirement is that sigma n, the last element of the permutation, should be an element of the subset J. And the cost is just the size of the subset J. Okay. So I now I have to go back and tell you how how what the constraints are on what Alice sends Bob. So here's the vector X. which initially starts out empty. And Alice receives sigma 1. And we'll think of sigma 1 as an index into this array. And that index, so Alice is allowed to write in that, ent in that position. Pardon me? Yeah. So. Alice receives sigma 1 first. And when, they rec when she receives sigma 1, she is now permitted to write a bit in the sigma 1th position of the array. Okay. Then she receives sigma 2. And then she is allowed to write a bit in the sigma 2th position of the array. So she cannot keep more information. What? She cannot keep more information. She can remember anything she wants. But this is, this is the message she's preparing to send Bob. And she's not allowed to go back and change anything. OK? So you know, she just writes something in sigma 1. Then she learns sigma 2. She writes something there a bit. She learns sigma 3. She writes something there. And then when she, what, finally, when we get to sigma n, well, at that point, she doesn't get to write her own bit. She has to write this bit B that arrives last. Okay. If she was allowed to write the, her own bit at sigma n, there would be a very trivial protocol. She would write zeros until the end. She would write a one, and then Bob could look at the vector and say, the output. You know, just look where the one is. But because Alice doesn't control the last bit, this creates a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Bob just looks at the vector and must output a subset of 1 through n with the requirement that the subset should contain sigma n, the last. The ver sigma n is the last thing that, that arrived for Alice. He tries to guess. He just wants to guess that. But he has to, he's going to guess it by guessing a subset. So he could just output 1 through n, but he pays for the size of the set. So if Alice had control of 
the last bit that arrived. Sigma, when sigma n arrives, if Alice could, had control of that bit, she could just write 0 every time until sigma n arrived, she could write 1. And then Bob will see a vector which is all zeros with 1, 1. And we'll just output that to the position of that one. But Alice doesn't have control over that bit, so Alice uh, you know, can't do anything. OK, so is the problem clear? OK. All right. Uh, worst case, but we'll we'll see. Yeah, at the moment it's 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 worst case. Okay, so let me give you two protocols for this. Okay. So protocol one. So Alice. Write zero in x sub sigma one and writes a one in x sub sigma n over two plus one. Okay. And uh, then the last bit gets filled in. So Bob looks at the vector. And just by counting the number of ones, he can determine whether the last bit that was written was a 1 or a 0. And once he knows that, he can output a set of size n over 2, which contains sigma n. So the, you know, uh, so the cost will be n over 2. OK. OK. So and now in protocol 2, uh, we divide up the, the bits into blocks of size square root n. So split the vector. And uh, when sigma i arrives, Alice writes 1 if sigma i is the last arrival in its block. and zero otherwise. So the picture is, you know, something arrives, Alice writes zero, zero. Then this block fills up, and she writes a one in the last bit that arrives. She does that in every block. Eventually, you're going to end up with something like this. So the one is What's that? The one doesn't have to be a zero. What? Same. Yeah, oh, I, I didn't mean the last, yeah, the last to arrive. So it, it's, which, I, yeah, that happened to be a, okay. a bad choice uh, over here. Um, and then eventually, well, the final bit, this is the final bit, and that gets filled in either a 0 or a 1. But when Bob looks at the output, Bob will either see one block, which is all zeros, in which case he knows that the sigma n belongs to that block, or he sees every block has exactly one 1, in which case he knows that the output is one of those ones. OK, so Bob. Uh,
either Bob sees an all zero block and outputs that. or outputs uh, the set of ones. And the cost of that is square root of n. OK, so you know, what, uh, what I say is, so now I've sort of, by, I present this and I've sort of sabotaged my talk at the beginning because, you know, I encourage you, now beat that, okay? You can ignore the rest of my talk and just uh, come up with a better protocol. All right, and one of the punchlines is that I do know a better protocol, but just slightly, okay? I know, okay. Uh, Okay, so that's the problem. It's cute. Why, why is it more than cute? All right, so uh, so let me talk about the sensitivity conjecture. Yeah, so this is a, an old conjecture. Um, from about 20 years ago, uh, more. And uh, so what I'm about to tell you, I mean, it's kind of standard stuff. You can find it in chapter 12 or 13 of Aurora Barak. Um, has to do with, well, you could say low level measures of Boolean complexity, of Boolean function complexity. All right, so I have Boolean function complexity, and I want to come up with measures of how complicated the function is. So we use circuit measures and things like that, which um, you know, could be as large as exponential in the number of variables. These low-level measures are measures which are bounded by the number of variables. So, the, so uh -huh. Okay, so what are what are some measures like this? So one is decision tree complexity. So if I write a decision tree for evaluating the um, the function, obviously that the and I take worst case cost, and the worst case depth of the decision tree will be at most the number of variables. Okay. Um, There's the uh, Fourier degree. Um, so you write f as a polynomial and uh, view it as a real polynomial and write up write a function f, uh, a polynomial which agrees with the Boolean function on the Boolean cube. And you look at the minimum degree. Well, standard stuff says that that polynomial, there is a polynomial in which no variable appears to higher power than one, and that polynomial is unique, and the degree of f is just that. Um, there's certificate complexity. All right. So, a certificate is a set of variables which, a setting of the variables, it's a partial setting of the variables which proves the value of the function. All right, so if I have a function uh, which is, oh, I don't know. Uh, well, let me, let me refer to a function similar to this, I have it related to this protocol, a function which is equal to one, you divide the variables into blocks of size square root of n, 
and it's equal to 1 if some block is set all to 1. All right. So if I just tell you that block, that would be a certificate if I tell you that block is all 1. Or if I tell you, if I give you a bunch of zeros, one in each block, then that would be a proof that the value of the function is zero. So that would also be a certificate. And the certificate complexity is the maximum over all possible settings of the variables of the minimum size of a certificate, which proves it for that. OK. So it goes just What's that? Just well, no, you want to prove. So for a given input, there is, it has a value. So think of it as non-deterministic complexity in the decision tree model. There is a setting of the variables. I want to convince, you know, so f of this particular input is either 0 or 1. And I want to convince you of the answer. So could be a different no. uh, That's right. So it's like I, so f based on the input, since I'm, you know, I, I can guess which positions to look at non-deterministically. And just check those, and so it's like non-deterministic decision tree complexity. Okay. And then there's sensitivity. So to define that, uh, S F of so the sensitivity of the function f at the input x equals uh, the number of neighboring inputs y of x. By neighboring, I just mean flip one bit, such that f of y is different than f of x. OK, so that's the sensitivity of f of x. If you think of the um, function as a coloring of the cube, of the Boolean cube, by zeros and ones, then you're looking at the point x, and you're looking at its neighbors in the graph and seeing how many guys have different colors. Um, OK, and then the sensitivity is the maximum over all x and 0, 1 to the n of s f of x. So if I take, let's say, something like the uh, and function. So at most inputs, there's only one 1. And if you're f you know, away from that, then you're at a point which is 0 and all its neighbors is 0. So that sensitivity is 0. But at the point which is 1, the sensitivity is n. So that means the sensitivity of the function is n. OK, so, so there was a line of research that was initiated by uh, Nissan and Segevi. Something, I don't know, 1992, something like this. Um, which was uh, relating these measures to each other. And I mean, I, I gave you four. Uh, there are, you know, at least a dozen more interesting measures that people have studied that go, that are like this. So I mean, just to say them but not write them, you know, for every measure like decision tree complexity, you also have the randomized versions, zero error, zero-sided error, one-sided error. You have the quantum version. Okay, uh, so you have okay. So the diff different uh, for Fourier degree, you can replace this by the degree of not computing the function exactly, but of approximating the function, and then you get an approximate Fourier approximate degree. Things like this. Um, okay, and so Nissan and Segedi uh, showed that many of these uh, measures are positive.
polynomial E. Polynomially equivalent. You say two measures are polynomially equivalent if for every Boolean function f, you know, one of the measures is bounded by a polynomial in the other and vice versa. Okay. So as an example, it's known that the Fourier degree is always less than or equal to the decision tree complexity. And a, 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 a cute, I mean more than cute, you know, a ni very a nice result in the Nissan Segedi paper is that the decision tree complexity is at most the Fourier degree raised to the sixth power. And that's, that power has been improved subsequently. But so those two th got things are polynomially related. And in fact, the state is that uh, basically uh, all interesting, well, I'm about to measures. So I'll just say in fact. are known to be polynomially equivalent. So that's a pretty vague statement, and I will keep it vague, but except except sensitivity. All right. So um, what is known is that the sensitivity is polynomially less than all the others. So it's bounded by a polynomial in any one, but it's not known the other way. Pardon me? It's well, it uh, depends who you ask. So that's the, se the sensitivity conjecture is that the sensitivity is polynomially equivalent to the others. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, um, yeah, I really don't know. You know, it's one of these, I, you know, I, you know, because I, you know, I kind of hope it's equivalent. So, I think that leads me to think, think that it's equivalent, but. So you're trying to show one direction, right? Yeah. So which direction? Well, you'll, you'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in, a, in five minutes. <laughs> let, um, okay, so it's known uh, that S of F is poly less than m of f for m equals decision tree or degree d, d of f or degree of f, et cetera. OK, so it's known that it's at most a polynomial of any one of these equivalent measures. So the n function is best in all of these measures? That's right. All these, the n function, it's the value is n. But it's polynomially less than. So it didn't, wouldn't mean, so there are functions which have higher sensitivity than degree, for example. So when, when I say that it's poly less, I'm saying it's no, less. Any of the worst yeah, but S of F is, yeah. So what this says is that for the AND function, the measure of the AND function on every one of these is at least N to the sum power. So if you want to prove a lower bound on any one of these measures, if it has high sensitivity, then it implies some bound on these. Th that depends that this poly is hiding what the exponent is, and the exponent will be different for different measures. OK. And the sensitivity conjecture. says that uh, S of F is poly 
equivalent. Okay, and then uh, I'll just mention there's a survey um, very might be variance I might have the which is in the um, it was written by some graduate students at the University of Chicago about four or five years ago uh, one of them, Puya Hatami, I guess, is coming here next year. Um, and this has a whole bunch of, pro there are a whole bunch of neat versions of this problem that people have proposed that are equivalent to or imply or implied by the sensitivity conjecture that are all open. Okay. Okay, so let me come back to my brain teaser so um, so here's a proposition if uh, if if uh, f is a boolean function with degree of f equal n. So I don't care how many variables f has. And sensitivity of f equals k. Then uh, Bob, Alice, I thought, Then Alice and Bob have a strategy. I should have given the, the game a name, which I will do now. The game I presented earlier, a strategy for GN uh, of cost uh, less than or equal to. Number of variables. Yeah, but it, you'll see in a minute when I do the proof of this, which will take three minutes or four minutes, uh, you'll see that it might as well be the number of variables. Okay. Um, so what does that say? It says that if you can prove a lower bound on this GN of something, let's say n to the one tenth then you will have proved the sensitivity conjecture. So corollary, if uh, the optimal strategy of GN has cost n to the delta for some constant delta, Than the sensitivity conjecture is true. Uh, I don't know. And I suspect. Well, you know, I, I, it, uh, of course, they might both be true. In which case, they um, they imply each other. It's very possible that the the game has a counterexample, and uh, and I I will. I will, yeah, so let's see. Uh, I, I don't know if I should, let me give you a, a slight, you know, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a table of contents or uh, what to expect in the rest of the talk, okay? So what I want to do, I'll, I'll prove this. That won't take very long. I will show you three strengthenings of the conjecture. Three, if you believe Sorry, now we'll throw away the sensitivity conjecture and just concentrate on the game. Okay, 
So I will, if, if you think, so notice I didn't pose a conjecture that the game has cost 10 to the delta. I mean, I could, but I'm not sure I believe it, but uh, it's just that, but you know, we, we tried pretty hard to beat it and we can't. Um, but I will pose three strengthenings of the conjecture that the uh, three natural ones, and I'll show you the two of the natural strengthenings are false. And the third one still might be true. Okay. And, but then at the end, I'll show, as you know, and once you see the two, the, the two strengthenings that I show you that are false, you'll be convinced that the conjecture can't possibly be true. Okay. But then I'll revive the conjecture by showing you something which sort of separates the actual conjecture from these strengthenings to see why the actual conjecture might still be true. Okay. So proof of the proposition. Okay, so I need a couple of facts. So first of all, you start with a Boolean function of degree f. I'm sorry, of degree f of degree n. Okay, so that means when you write this function as a multivariate polynomial, it has a term of degree n. Okay, now if you fix all the variables outside of that term of degree n, it simplifies the function. But you can show well, you know. If you take a maximal term and you fix all the other variables, that term will never go away. So you'll end up with a function which still has degree n. So you might as well assume that the function you started with had exactly n variables. Okay. Okay. So you know we're given f without loss of generality, f has n variables. OK, now the next observation to make is that if I, if I give you a, a polynomial viewed as a Boolean function on 0 and 1, then if you pick a variable, then the degree is something. Okay? If you pick a variable, then there's a way of setting that variable. Well, when you set that variable, the polynomial simplifies. And the degree might go down. Okay? But, and it could go down a lot. But one way or the other of setting the variable, the degree drops by at most one. So a fact, you know, given a polynomial p of x1 through xn uh, and i and n, uh, there exists. Um, a i and zero one, such that p of x one. So this is now a, just on n minus one variables. Has degree at least the degree of p minus one. All right. So that's just a little exercise that it's easy to show. OK, but this, this fact gives Alice, to, was going to give us Alice a strategy. Namely, she takes the function f, she writes it as a polynomial. When a variable arrives, she has to decide whether to fill in a 0 or a 1. And she fills in the variable in such a way that the degree of the polynomial representing the residual function drops by at most 1. Okay, So you just do this. So. Alice fills in the bits um, so that the um, degree of the residual polynomial. So we're interpreting what Alice is doing is actually fixing bits, input bits to this thing after. Uh, 
the first high bits. Um, is greater than or equal to n minus i. In fact, it'll equal n minus i. Okay, it can't be bigger than it. Okay. All right, fine. So now let's look at the end of the game. So now, at the very end, Alice, Alice has filled it n minus one positions, and the residual function still has degree one. What does that mean? It means that when you have fixed all these bits, the input is now one of two neighboring inputs. And to say that the function still has degree 1 is to say the function is not constant, which means you found two neighboring inputs which differ. One's 0 and one is 1. OK. And now the. You know, the adversary fills in that bit. OK, so now Bob sees a vector, sees an input. And now he's got to try to configure out, you know, wh what's the set of possible last bits. But every last bit has to be um, a position which, if you flipped, would be sensitive. It would flip the value. Okay? So the sensitivity of this final input is exactly the size of the set. So, you know, uh, Bob gets vector x and outputs the set j of coordinates j such that f of x is different than f of x where that just means flip the jth bit. OK, so that's it. Questions on that? OK, so now we completely forget Boolean functions. We completely forget sensitivity, degree. The only thing we have is the game. So let me remind you what the game is, just to make sure that the, everybody's since we're switching context again. So, so the game is Alice, Bob. Alice is getting sigma and, sigma and B, a permutation in B. Alice is writing bits one at a time, where she's allowed to write bits according to the permutation, except that the, uh, in the order, but she can't go back and rewrite things. The very last bit is written uh, is B. And then Bob gets to look at the vector x that Alice produces and has to select a subset j, output it, and that j is required to contain the last bit position. OK, so everybody remember that? Any, any questions? OK. So here are some strengthenings. So first strengthening is, OK, so let me just say, so I mean, what is, there's somehow the intuition, if you think about this problem for a while, there's somehow some sort of information theoretic intuition, even if, you know, but making that explicit seems kind of hard. But, you know, that when Alice is writing a bit early on, her knowledge of what the last bit is going to be is very little, right? You know, when I write the first bit, I'm trying to tell Bob something useful about what the last bit is. And from my point of view at this point, the last bit could be any one of n minus 1 positions. And even, you know, after I've seen, you know, the first half of the bits when I write something, I've still, my uncertainty is n over 2. So, so it seems like the bits I'm writing early on carry very little information about what the identity of the last bit is. OK, so that's, OK, now if you think of that intuition, then the same intuition seems to, to hold if, instead of allowing Alice to write a bit, you allow her to write a trit. You know? So she has a larger alphabet. So alphabet, uh, Alice 
uh, fills in x from an alphabet of constant size c. So it's still the case that you know, even if I can write in each position, I can write two bits instead of one that Second is that we just um, sigma b are chosen uniformly at random. So I've been thinking of sigma and b as being chosen adversarially. But suppose sigma is just a random permutation and b is a random bit. And then you could ask, and you look at the the expected cost. of uh, the strategy. So instead of looking at worst case, you look at the expected. So you might hope that the expected cost is still high. For example, I mean, in the, in the protocol I gave that costs square root of n, it doesn't matter which permutation comes. The cost is always square root of n. So, I, I, so the expected cost will still be square root. Okay, and the third one, third re reformulation involves um, looking at this, but le now let's change the game a little bit in a way that we try to make the information theoretic content explicit. So this is like an information theoretic version. So again, sigma and b are random. And so the you know if we fix this for a fixed strategy, uh, Alice's output x. Um, is a random variable. Which depends on this input randomness. And now you can look at uh, how much entropy is left. So this is what Bob is trying to guess. And you can look at you know, conditioned on the random variable x that Bob sees, how much entropy is left here. And now our conjecture, uh, so is it true? So what would we like to say? So we want to say that this is, right, there's log n bits of entropy in this thing. And we'd like to show that the residual entropy is omega log n. Okay, so fine. So now let's go back to number one. Uh, so one thing we have is we have a strategy for Alice and Bob. And the, if they have an alphabet of size three, then we have a strategy whose cost instead of being n to the delta is just order log n. Yeah. So there's no reason to believe this two should close at all, right? So with every sensitivity, the thing breaks down. Right? No, that's true. But this is re so. I want to say that so number two still could be true. So average sensitivity, yeah, that's, that's a good point. One of the things about this is that 
if you do average sensitivity, like you, instead of looking at the worst case sensitivity, you look at the average. The average can be tiny, like the AND function has very tiny average sensitivity because it most inputs, okay? But somehow the averaging that's done there is completely unrelated to the averaging that's done here. And so this thing could still be true. We don't have a counterexample to this. So this is open. And then the one that I found most disappointing was this one's not true. OK. So there is a protocol. So notice in this version, the game, the, the game sort of disappeared. We're no longer requiring Bob to output anything. The only thing we're looking at is, you know, what is the entropy left in sigma n? Okay, and this will be order log log n. Okay. Uh, so good. Let me tell you how these let, tell you how these pro, uh, strategies go. Say again. Well, it depends. Uh, in the original version, no. So in the original version, he must output a set which contains sigma n. Okay. Now, what, the reason why he can beat this is because if you allow him to err with a little probability, he can exploit that. Okay. That's, that's, what, that's actually what's happening here. So let me let me show you how to beat the conjecture three first. Okay, so interpret um, the indices. one through n has uh, vectors in gf2 to the k, where k is equal to log n. All right, so just you know, write, the, write these things in binary. So we'll have a parameter t, which eventually we'll choose to be like log squared n. But we have a parameter t. And here's, here's um, Alice's strategy. So for the first n minus t, she just writes 0. So now there's a subset of t things that have yet to arrive. And those are, we are interpreting them as vectors, mod, you know, uh, mod 2 of length k. And provided that t is a lot larger than log n, which it will be, we'll see in a minute, then there will be subsets of vectors that are left that add up to 0. Uh, you know, in this, okay. So she chooses the largest subset that adds up to zero. Okay, so subset uh, S of indices. There exists a subset R uh, 
of size um, at least t minus log n that sum to 0 as vectors. And why at least t minus log n? Because if you have found something which sum to 0, if you look at the one, the guys outside the subset, they're linearly dependent. So you can find a dependence there and just add it to the subset r. OK, so Alice uh, puts 1 in the positions of r. And zero elsewhere. Okay. Well, except for the last one. Which yeah. Well, but she doesn't control that. Yeah. Okay. So now look at Bob's position. So there are two possibilities. Bob looks at the positions where there's ones. And if it does not sum to zero, well, then how could that be? Only if the last bit was 0, right? I think that's right. So if it doesn't sum to, and therefore, all he has to do is find, look at the sum of these guys, you know, to interpret them as vectors, take the vector sum, and he'll be able to determine what the last bit is. OK. So the other possibility is that it does sum to 0. Now, how could that have happened? Well, it could be. There are two cases. One was the last position, sigma n, belongs to the set R. OK, well, good. Then it's one of the ones. It's one of the things. Or it could be that sigma n didn't belong to R, right? And then the, and the bit was set to 0. Now, in that case, Bob really doesn't know what to do because he can, you know, if it, in the case that it was all zeros, but what's the chance that that happened? So the chance that that happened was that the, the last thing did not belong to R. But R is t minus log n of the positions. So the chance that it doesn't belong to R is log n over t. Okay. So the point is that um, so if Bob sees a vector whose ones sum to 0, by which I mean you know, the vectors associated to those ones, then the conditional probability with probability uh, log n over t uh, sigma n is a 0, and with probability 1 minus log n over t, sigma n is a 1. Okay. Say again? What do you mean by probability? Oh, because th we're getting it. We're, this is over, you know, the, this whole setting is where the permutation is coming in, is a random permutation. So conditioned on that permutation, if I see this situation, it would be that sigma n did not lie in the subset R. And that's a very low probability event. So there's very high, that has very high entropy at this point, but it's multiplied by this log n over t. And otherwise, it's this. So you also have to give away a bit. So you could imagine if you're trying to figure out the bound the entropy, you say, well, you know, you give away one bit, which determines which of these two situations you're in. That's one bit of entropy. And then conditioned on that, well, it's this situation, which is at most log n bits of entropy multiplied by this probability, plus this situation, which is only log t bits of entropy, roughly, um, multiplied by this probability. So if you choose t to be log squared n, then you get a log log n. OK. Um, <laughs> we 
we're, we're almost out of time. So uh, let me just, I'm going to tell you two things. Uh, very quickly, let me tell you what the protocol is that beats three bits. Okay, but I won't prove it to you. Okay, but it, the proof is not hard. But um, okay, so now we have three symbols. Again, we'll have a parameter t, and t will be let's say a hundred log n in this case. OK, so Alice is going to say, say 0 for first n minus t. And then in the remaining, she'll only say 1s and 2s. So for the last t, say only 1 or 2. But I have to say, how does she do it? So let's look at the n choose t possible sets that might be left. Okay? And let's look at the graph on those n choose t sets where two sets are neighbors if they it's just a, if they differ in a, have symmetric difference too. Okay? So and let, so that graph has um, degree something like you know how many neighbors does somebody have you can throw pick somebody to throw away which is like t choices and pick somebody to add in which is like n minus t so it's like n times t so the degree of that graph is n times t so that graph can be colored in at most n times t colors so you now color the n choose t subsets of size t with, so just to be trivial, so just less than n squared. We can do much better than that. But n squared colors uh, so that neighbors have different colors. OK. Now I want to. The color set has size n squared. I want to use and do an error correcting code of those n squared colors. In which, so let C map n squared to, so my symbols will be 1 and 2, to the t. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to map every. This is only this is a set of size n squared, which is log two log n bits, and I'm going to map it to t bits. And if you take a random mapping, it has the following error correcting property, which is that if I give you the output, and even if I suppress one bit, if I flip a bit or if I throw a bit away, you'll be able to recover the original thing. So that's a good enough. And you can do, if t is 100 log n, a random code works. So now all you do is you fill in uh, what Bob does, Alice does, is just writes the code of this set, which is this last t. So she wrote 0 here. She looks at the last set. She applies the code. She colors the set. She looks at the color. She codes the color. OK, now when Bob receives the thing, the first thing he does is he tries to recover what was the code word. Well, it's an error correcting code. What's happened is that there might be a bit that's been flipped, or it could be missing because maybe the bit was set to 0 at the end. Then he can recover the code word. Once he recovers the code word, he recovers the color. Once he recovers the color, well, He's trying to recover what this set of last t bits was. And there might be something missing from it. But uh, 
given that we have this coloring, it, that will uniquely determine what the thing, uh, what the set was. And once he knows the last t, that's what he outputs. Okay, so that's the protocol. What's that? Why? Oh, because I said zero for the first n minus t, and then I'm using one and two here. Then how do I tell the ones that occurred here from the ones that occurred here? I don't know which ones were the ones that occurred first versus the ones that occurred last. Okay, so the final remark, and this you'll have to look at the paper for, is that um, I said, so this, you should feel very pessimistic about the conjecture based on these examples, okay? However, these examples have, exhibit a certain property, and the property is something which uh, we call monotonicity, which is if you, if you view Alice's strategy of what she writes as a function of what the uh, bits have been filled in already, okay? Then they're mon the strategy is monotone in the sense that if you decided that, let's say, if this one arrives, I'm going to write a zero or a one, and then it doesn't arrive, but something else arrives, then you won't change your mind. You'll still write a one. In other words, you start out writing zeros in everything, and then at some point you switch for each bit. At this point, I might switch to wanting to write a one here. Okay, so I, I'm not formally defining it. I can do that at lunch. But you've, so you have a property of monotonicity. And then, so these protocols, or something very similar to them, not quite the way I described them, but the protocols are monotone. But now if you go to the original problem and you restrict yourself to monotone protocols, then we have a proof of a lower bound of log n. Okay, so in that case, when you restrict to the protocols that satisfy the property that these guys do, then we can prove a lower bound for the original conjecture of log n. Log n. What? Log n. Log n. Uh, I'm sorry, not log n. No, I, I, I'm sorry, square root, I said log n. Square root of n. Yeah, I, I, not what I want. We can prove a square root. Of, in fact, we can prove that the protocol I started with is optimal. However, I do know a non-monotone protocol that's a little better than square root of n. And that protocol is like 0.99 uh, square root of n. So you can shave off a little bit. But, but it says that non-monotonicity does buy you something in the, in the original problem. It could buy you a lot more. But OK, so that's where things stand. Okay, so 